chunk of you told me uh, that you actually watched the other videos and you liked it and you want me to continue. So I will do so for the half of you that are actually watching this. Um, and yes, you'll note that the things that I kind of point out in the videos, I actually talk about again in class. So think of it again, it's not replacing what's happening in class, but at least it helps guide you and in, in things to look for. with chapter 20. Um, so chapter 20, and I realize I'm sorry, these chapters are kind of long, but it is, a, it, I mean, it's a long book. Um, but chapter 20 begins in a very, I guess, eerie manner. Um, it's supernatural, it's scary, it's frightening. It's a random scream in the middle of the night that's very unearthly. Um, and it wakes everyone up and essentially everyone's awake. They're milling about, and just like, hey, yo, don't worry calm down, let's get settled. It's just a play that we're rehearsing. But then afterwards, he comes back and knocks on Jane's door. And I want you to realize that that's really scandalous. I mean, even if you think about it today, if that happened, a man knocks on a single woman's door at the middle of the night, yes, that's that will cause some eyebrow raise, right? And so the fact that he does that now in the Victorian society, 18th century, sorry, 19th century, 17th century, whatever, 1800s, um, would have been very, very scandalous. Now, granted, there's nothing inappropriate that goes on between the two of them. He's actually just asking for her help. But the fact that he is willing to knock on her door and also ask her for help for this kind of sticky situation tells you what about how he views her. Um, and so the whole situation is that we find Mr. Mason, our stranger that arrived, he's injured, he's bloodied, and Rochester has a lot of trust in Jane, obviously, when he's like, hey, hang tight, don't talk to him, I'll BRB. Um, and so I want you to just make note of, of Jane's kind of thought process. Um, she is very bright, she's very logical, she has a really great processing system, and, and so she kind of goes through everything. And she has a lot of rhetorical questions, like, why did this happen? What's going on? Why? What? How? Who? What? Why? And what is the effect of these back-to-back -back questions? Because there are all these questions that she's asking, but there are no what. And so what is the effect of that on the reader when you have question after question after question, but no answer? Um, and then of course Rochester comes back and, and I want you to note um, the injury that Mason has, um, what type of injury is it specifically, and also in their conversation it's very ambiguous and vague. I mean they're talking about a she and they're saying something but we really don't know what's going on so we can't follow and obviously neither can Jane and what's the effect of that. So all of this vagueness, this ambiguity and all of these questions and no answers Again, why does Charlotte Bronte write like this? What is the purpose she or what is the effect that she's trying to achieve for her reader? And then the conversation at the end of 20 between Rochester and Jane, I'm hoping you're realizing, you know, as the chapters have progressed, it's very clear, of course, and I think I mentioned it, that Rochester is into Jane and vice versa. But it's also clear that Jane has got no idea. It is just going above her head. And in this chapter, um, he, you know, hands her a flower, a rose, you know, and when you give people roses, it's typically a romantic thing or something. He says, well then, Jane, call to aid your fancy, and someone's fancy are their thoughts, their imagination, call to aid your fancy. Suppose you are no longer a girl well-reared and disciplined, but a wild boy indulged from childhood upwards. Look at that passage, that monologue. What is he asking Jane to do? What is he asking her to think about? And why is he asking her that? What is the purpose? What is his motivation? And what is he trying to actually tell her with this particular monologue? Hopefully you get it. If not, we'll, we'll talk about it in class. Um, and then she responds um, and essentially he pauses and then he switches gears and he, she notices his tone shift. Um, little friend said he in quite a changed tone while his face changed to losing all of its softness and gravity and becoming harsh and sarcastic. You've noticed my tender penchant from his Ingram. Don't you think if I married her, she would regenerate me with a vengeance? And so why does he randomly switch gears and bring Blanche Ingram up? What's the, what's the intent behind that? And I want you to think about, I don't know, the game of love and how 
not like the literal game, but just the idea of how people, when they are interested in other people or when they're trying to see or whatever, how, how do we navigate that? How do men and women, girls, boys navigate that? What do they do, you know? Um, or what do they not do, you know? So there's that. What would I do without your smart mouth drawing me? Jane goes back to Gateshead at the request of Mrs. Reed. Um, and so there, it's a longer chapter. Um, and one, I do want you to know before Jane heads back to Gateshead, she does have a curious conversation with Rochester. It's very confusing to her and she's perplexed. And I think it's a little confusing to us as well. But I want you to, again, realize that Rochester is in love with Jane. And he essentially is making plans um, and doesn't want her to leave. And he essentially is saying that without saying it. And she's like, and we're like, so just, we'll talk about that later. But so, so one, the Reed children, I talked about it in the earlier chapters, like how are they characterized? What were their actions? And how does that, how does that reflect or does that reflect you know, similarly or differently when they're grown up and adults um, about John Reed, Eliza Reed, Georgiana Reed, tell me about their their endings, essentially. And in, in many movies, novels, TV shows, if you think about that idea, um, that's how authors and writers try to portray the moral of their lesson. Like the bad guy has a bad ending, the good guy has a good ending. So X, Y, Z, that means be good and you'll have a happy Ellie ever after. And so what kinds of traits is Charlotte Bronte trying to push us away from as humans? If you think about John Reed, Eliza and Georgiana, what is she saying about those types of people and how they end up? So those are things to note. This is where we find that Mrs. Reed is not redeemable. I mean, she is a pretty terrible person, honestly. She's not a good person at all. And so, but I, I want you to know that Mrs. Reed essentially tells Jane, like, hey, um, you do have family, other family that actually care about you, maybe wanted to find you, but I told them that you were dead. And that's a pretty crappy thing to do. I mean, that's, that's terrible, evil, cruel. I mean, that's really bad. But really throughout all of this, I want you to like watch Jane's maturity and her growth. How does she respond and how does that show you her growth? Um, this is a coming of age novel. It's a buildings romance. So I want you to think and really, really see, like find lines where she's just so beautifully mature like it is astounding and you see that no kidding, I can't and returning back to thornfield hall and i want you to note that yeah she's she's returning home and she says that i'm returning home how people feel when they return home from an absence gateshead is not her home although she grew up there it's not her home and lo and behold mr rochester is casually conveniently coincidentally outside waiting for her question mark um hello there you are come on if you please and so he speaks to her and he's just really playful like he's he's and she's kind of sad um and he essentially is like you know she asks him about being in London. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah. Miss Fairfax told me you were in London. He's like, oh, do you know why? And she's like, yeah, I know why. And he's like, yeah, buy a carriage for my wife, for Mrs. Rochester. I can't wait for you to see it. Mrs. Rochester will love it. And I want you to, again, I say this a lot, note that he loves her and he's essentially implying that she's the Mrs. Rochester, but what does she believe? This entire time she's in her head, Blanche Ingram, Blanche Ingram. And so he's kind of trolly. <laughs> you find it a lot in these chapters. He he kind of purposefully confuses her and she's which is really messed up. It's messed up. I mean, it is because he's she's distraught. She's and he's just, you know. And there's a really part that's beautiful. I think it's one of probably the one of the more beautiful lines in this particular novel she says thank you mrs rochester for your great kindness i'm strangely glad to get back again to you and wherever you are is my home my only home 
she calls him her home, not just him, wherever you are. You could be anywhere and it's him. That is so romantic. So I was like, oh, like, right? Cute. Okay, I've only said it once this entire time. I'm feeling like it's progress. That beautiful mind, I'm your magical. This is the chapter. This is the chapter. Um, It's not obviously the climax because I wouldn't say it is. It's 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 getting there though, but it's a big crucial turning point because this is a chapter where they both officially acknowledge their love for each other out loud in person, all that stuff. One, note the weather, the weather, um, and how it's described in chapter twenty-three and why that's important. What literary device, figurative language, am I talking about? especially knowing that they confess their love to each other. So Jane and Rochester are having a conversation. And again, he's pretty trolly. I mean, he essentially tells her like, Thornfield's great, right? Do you love it? Do you love it? She's like, yeah, I love it. He's like, it's gonna suck that you have to leave because you're gonna have to move on and I'm getting married, you know? And she's like, yeah, very soon. And so he like, it's almost as if He's purposefully egging her on. Sorry, this is Penny. She's being very needy right now. Um, and he asks her asks her questions that I almost like he knows will make her feel distraught. Like telling her about, you know, will you miss being at Thornfield? How was the distance to you? And you see her building up this emotion. Like it, it progresses. It's almost like a wave. It, it, it It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and she starts to like sob because he's making her feel so distraught because he's he's telling her like you're gonna be gone forever aren't you gonna be sad and at the end of it I tell you I must go I retorted roused to something like passion do you think I can stay to become nothing to you do you think that I am an automaton a machine without feelings and can bear to have my morsel of bread snatched from my lips and my drop of living water dash from my cup? Do you think because I am poor, obscure, plain and little, I am soulless and heartless? You think wrong. I have as much soul as you and full as much heart. And this is a powerful and beautiful and an empowering moment because she's like, I may be poor, I may be plain, I may not be, you know, all of these great things, but I have a heart and I have rights and really claiming that acknowledgement of her feelings and acting upon it. That's huge, huge, huge. And he's like, ah, this is what I was looking for. This is what I, and so I don't know why he just didn't ask her. He could have just said, hey, do you love me? And I think that <laughs> with any movie, novel, TV show, the problem with everything is lack of communication. Like if he had just said, hey, I'm into you, are you into me? We would have been done with this like 300 pages ago probably but you know how it goes people are incapable of communicating directly um and so then he asks her to marry him i ask you to pass through life at my side like i ask you i offer you my hand and she's like you're joking you're you're kidding and he's like no no i'm asking you and he essentially says you know in the next couple of pages jane i summon you as my wife so at the end of 23 when they confess their love, what happens? It's very important to, to note. And what might that mean? Everything is symbolic and means something in literature. You know that. Um, and I would say in, very, in Jane Eyre, like it, it's like pretty in your face, right? It's not like this, like, I don't know. No, it's, it's pretty clear. Um, and so what happens at the end of 23 as they are falling in love, kissing, um, and what, what might that mean? And then afterwards, when they go back inside, because, oh my gosh, Miss Fairfax caught them kissing, which is very scandalous. Um, but at the end of it, what does Adele tell Jane? And again, what does that mean? Um, what is that an example of? Um, and so that's it. That's 20 through 23 in kind of a nutshell-ish things to look for. That's it. Okay. Um, look, we're in chapter 23 already. We're almost basically done with the novel. It's going to progress really fast. And I'm super proud of you if you've been reading. If you haven't, I'm not as proud of you. But please read. Please. Okay. I will see you later. Bye. Right. And I'm so